Welcome back. So, over the last uh, few lectures, we have been looking at how heat affects objects, how it changes the temperature, how it can change the phase. What we're going to do today is, for lecture number 22, the transfer of heat, we're going to talk about how heat as energy gets from one place to another. There are basically three different ways that heat can move, and I'll put those up on the overhead. So the three types of transfer of heat are convection, conduction, and radiation. And we'll look at these one at a time, actually in this order. So to begin with, convection. Convection is the process in which heat is carried from place to place by the bulk movement of a fluid. So first of all, why is this uh, method uh, prominent in a fluid? Well, that's because we need the bulk movement of the material. And what kind of materials flow? Fluids. That's one of the classifications of a fluid. It flows. So by uh, movement of the fluid, by flowing, it carries heat. As the fluid moves, it carries the heat with it. When it does that, it makes what we call a convection current. And I'd like to actually do a little demonstration to demonstrate a convection current. Now, let's just think about this first. When something heats up, we know that typically it expands. When something expands, its volume increases. When the volume increases for a constant mass, the density decreases. Now, we know when we have two uh, substances together, if one has a lower density, that will tend to make it rise within the material of the higher density. So, if we have reason, re, regions in a fluid with lower density, that region is going to tend to rise. In other words, when we have warmer regions, regions that have expanded and have lower densities, they will rise. Regions of colder, uh, or colder regions that have higher densities will tend to sink. So, let's take a look at that. So here I have a propane torch, and what I want you to notice is I'm shining the light on the torch, and I want you to look at the air on the screen behind the torch. And what you'll notice is that the heat from the torch is heating the air, and you can actually see it rising behind the torch. As the light goes through the air, the different densities of the air have slightly different uh, refraction properties, and so you can actually see it as little tiny variations in shadow on the back. So we can see those uh, convection currents in the air. Now I'm going to show a slightly different convection current. What I'm going to do is heat up this mass of brass, and then I'm going to put it into this sample of water and shine the light through it, and we'll actually be able to see the convection currents uh, in the water that way. So let me just heat this up. Okay, now I'll put it in the water and we'll see the convection currents. I'll turn the lights off so that uh, we can see them a little bit better. There we go. I hope you can see those convection currents rising up off of that hot piece of metal and you can see them going up to the surface. Okay, very good. So convection currents don't happen just on a small scale. They can happen on a scale of a room where you might have a heater in a room that heats up the air, that causes the air to rise, maybe move across the ceiling, come down over near a colder area, move across the floor back to the heater, and so you get these convection currents within a room, and that helps distribute the heat and warm up the room. Uh, it could also uh, work kind of in the reverse fashion in a refrigerator. You might have a condensing unit in the refrigerator that cools the air, that takes the energy out, it makes it uh, more dense, it causes that air to, uh, to, to fall, it moves across the floor as it slightly warms up and moves up a wall, maybe uh, the side of the, the refrigerator and then comes back to the, to the cooling unit and causes a convection current within the refrigerator to, to drive the, the cold air around and that helps cool off the entire refrigerator. It can also work on a global scale. Imagine we've got the earth here with sunlight coming from the sun. The sun is way off down there. Sunlight is coming in. Here's the atmosphere around the earth. Now this is greatly exaggerated. The atmosphere is actually much thinner than this. And we notice that the sunlight coming in strikes the uh, atmosphere near the Earth's equator in a much more direct angle, while near the poles it comes in much more obliquely. This means that basically the atmosphere around the equator gets much more heat, direct heat, much less heat near the poles. 
Now that causes the air near the equator to warm up and rise. So this air is going to tend to rise while the air, the atmosphere near the poles will be cooler and tend to sink. So if the Earth were not rotating, if it was completely, uh, say, in a heliocentric orbit, which always presented the same face to the sun, we would have a convection current around the atmosphere looking something like this. Rising in the poles, coming across the top of the atmosphere, rising near the equator, coming across the top of the atmosphere, falling near the poles, and kind of circulating around like that. But because the Earth is rotating, it breaks up this gigantic cell into three smaller parts. Let me redraw that. So we end up with these currents that tend to rise near the equator, move north and south, uh, uh, north and south of the equator, and then sink at a higher latitude, and then we have a rising area up closer to the poles that then sinks much nearer to the poles. So we end up with these three regions in each hemisphere, and these are called the Hadley cells. Now let's think about an area over the ocean where we might be getting some sunlight that's warming up the water, and that water then warms up the air above it and causes that air to rise. That causes a low pressure zone. So what happens in a region like that? Let's imagine we have this low pressure zone over the ocean where the, the warm water has heated the air above it, causes the air to rise. Well, air around that has to come in from the sides and fill it in. So we have air coming in from the sides to fill in that low pressure zone so that it can then rise. Well, let's think about when we have air, say in the northern hemisphere, moving in the northerly direction. Well, the Earth is rotating. So we've got the whole Earth that's spinning around. And if we look down from the North Pole, we look down on the Earth, the Earth actually rotates in a counterclockwise direction. So the Earth is actually spinning this way, if this is the North Pole. Now, let's think about what happens to air in the northern hemisphere that is moving north. Well, the equator is going around, any point on the equator is going around a great big circle, about 24,000 miles every 24 hours. So the equator is moving, any point on the equator is moving very, very rapidly to the east. Now let's imagine we have some air here that's then moving up further to the north. Well, the points uh, at, a, at a latitude above the equator have a smaller circle to go around every 24 hours, so they're not moving as fast to the east. So we have air that's moving very rapidly to the east, moving over land that is moving, or water, that's moving less rapidly to the east. That air is going to veer off to the east. Likewise, air from the, from the North Pole moving south is going to go from a region of, of land that's moving not so fast to the east over land that is moving faster to the east. It's going to lag behind and veer off to the west. So what's going to happen here? This air that's moving north, that's going to end up veering off to the east. This air that's moving south is going to veer off to the west. That's going to kick this air in the middle around in this direction, in a counterclockwise direction. Well, as that air keeps pushing that in, and this goes faster and faster and faster and gains more energy, and it will gain more energy as long as that warm water is feeding energy into it, making it rise, pulling air in from the north and the south. Well, what's that? That is a hurricane. And you'll notice that typically hurricanes in the northern hemisphere will rotate in a counterclockwise direction because of this effect, and this is called the Coriolis effect. The Coriolis effect is this, this uh, effect that as air moves north or south, it has this either easterly or westerly uh, motion 
that comes about because it's moving on a rotating surface, the Earth being the rotating surface. So this Coriolis effect actually is what drives this rotation of the hurricanes. If you look at um, a hurricane in the southern hemisphere, you will find exactly the reverse happening, and so we end up with the hurricanes traveling in the clockwise direction in the southern hemisphere. So does the Coriolis effect have any effect on the Hadley cells? Yes, they do. Yes, it does. Notice that these Hadley cells, we have air here flowing from the north to the south in this lowest Hadley cell. So we have air coming from the north going to the south, that's going to veer to the west, and that is called the easterly trade winds. Uh, winds are typically uh, named after the direction they're coming from as opposed to the direction they're going. So this is coming from the east, blowing more to the west, so these are the east easterly trade winds. Now, this next block up here, we have wind going from the north to the south. That's going to veer off to the east, so those are called the temperate westerlies. And then up here near the poles, we have, again, wind going north to south, so those are going to veer off to the west, and those are called the polar easterlies. And these uh, winds have been used by sailors and also by um, uh, airplane pilots now to help whenever they need to go north or uh, uh, east or west. They take advantage of those to, uh, to help them go faster or go whatever direction they're trying to go. Okay, great. Now, what's the next uh, uh, form of heat transfer? Well, let's take a look at that one. The next method of heat transfer is called conduction. Conduction is the process whereby heat is transferred directly through a material with any bulk motion of the material playing no role in the transfer. This is typically the type of energy transfer that we find in solids because fluids will flow uh, uh, and thereby use convection. Solids, which, which cannot flow, use conduction. So how does heat transfer in solids? How does it move from place to place? So let's imagine we've got some solid object and we make one end hot, maybe we connect it or touch it to some uh, hot object, and we make the other end cold. We uh, maybe touch it to a cold object or something like that. Now, let's imagine, uh, so what's going to happen? Well, heat energy is going to go from the hot end through the material to the cold end. Now, let's imagine that our object here has got some cross-sectional area A. Remember cross-section, if we cut across it this way and then look at what that shape is, let's imagine that it's got some area A. A is the area that we are connecting the hot and the cold areas together, the hot and the cold sections together. And then L, let's say this object has a length L, so L is the distance from the hot end to the cold end. Let's see if we can figure out how much heat is actually going to um, conduct through this uh, material, or at least make some ideas, get some ideas about it. Well, first, the larger the temperature difference, we would expect the more energy to flow through. If these are maybe one degree different, there's not going to be a lot of energy flowing through. But if they're 100 degrees different, we would expect a whole lot more. And we might expect that the amount of energy to be proportional to the temperature distance. And that's a very reasonable approximation to start with. So we'll say that Q is proportional to the difference in temperature, or delta T. In other words, the hot temperature minus the cold temperature. What's the difference in those temperatures? Then, what about the area? Well, the more area that we use to connect these two different temperature regions together, we would expect the more energy to flow. And actually, that seems reasonable. So we would expect Q to be actually proportional to the area. Now, what about L? Well, the farther apart these are, the less energy we would expect to flow. So we might expect the energy Q to be inversely proportional to L. So maybe 1 over L. Okay, great. Uh, now, what about if we wait a longer amount of time? If we wait for a long time, we would expect more heat to flow. If we wait a very short amount of time, we would expect a small amount of heat to flow, assuming we maintain these two temperature differences. So we might expect then Q to be proportional to the time. And then one more thing, different materials would allow different amounts of heat to flow through. So the material that this thing is made of, that will affect how much heat flows through. Is it a good heat conductor? 
Is it a poor heat conductor? In other words, is it a good insulator? So we would expect this to somehow depend on the material. Well, great. Actually, as a matter of fact, those are the only things we need to worry about. And we can write this as an equality then by saying that Q is equal to... Now, the dependence on the material, I'm going to write that as a constant K. K is called the heat conductivity, and I'll come back to that in just a second. K times the area times the temperature difference, delta T, times the time T, and then divided by L. And there we go. This is called the heat conduction equation. And K is called the thermal conductivity for the material. And it basically tells us how good is the material as a conductor. A large value of K means the material will conduct heat very easily. A small value of K will mean it does not conduct heat very well. In other words, it would be a good insulator. It would be a good thing to keep heat in an object, not allow it to flow out. So what are the units of K? Well, by inverting this, we can see the units of K will be the units of Q times the units of L divided by the units of A, delta T, little t, which it then turns out are, well, I'll just write that out. That would be the units of Q times the units of L divided by the units of A divided by the units of delta T divided by the units of little t, time, which give us what? The units of Q, that's a heat, so joules, times meters, over area, meters squared, times delta T, degrees centigrade, times little t, seconds. Well, one of the meters can't, whoops, one of the meters cancels, and we are left with joules per meter, degree Celsius, seconds. There we go. So those are the units of K. So let's stick some numbers in here and uh, try this out. 